has been a postdoctoral fellows at the Institute for Mittelalter Forschung of the Österreichische Academy der Wissenschaften in Vienna, and uh, also at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris, but also at Dumbarton Ox, and uh, of course here in Athens at the Italian Archaeological School. So for you, it's a sort of uh, um, come back uh, at home, uh, coming home. His main sure. research areas uh, are um, the archaeology of the late antiquity and the early Byzantine period, with a special reference to the evolution of urbanism and civic life, but also the Christianization of death and the patronage of building in the early Byzantine Empire. He mainly deals with material evidence, but he is also interested in uh, how this relates and uh, can be combined uh, with uh, literary sources. The paper he presents today explores the social and economic status of early Byzantine carvers and uh, in the light of the archaeological and the textual evidence. Before giving the floor to Dr. Marano, I would like to remind that these uh, seminars were created as a moment to provide an opportunity of debate. And therefore, at the, um, there will be a short uh, discussion after the, after the talk. So now, Yuri, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, good. So I would like first to thank Paolo and Barbara for the opportunity to present my research. And obviously, it's a pleasure to be here with you, even from a distance, because I see many friends and colleagues. And uh, I want to thank you, them all, for um, coming. And then, I, I'm afraid I should admit that the title that I gave to this paper is, is partly misleading. In re <clears throat> as, you, as many of you know, in recent years, a considerable amount of uh, research on the construction of ancient buildings has been made. To enhance our understanding of the logistics of Roman buildings, of, of Roman buildings, scholars have exploited 19th century building manuals. These manuals provide labor constants for a variety of stone types and stone objects, columns, capitals, square blocks and archaeologists and architectural historians used them to calculate the cost and the labor involved in the carving of architectural elements and ornamentation during the Roman period. This was my original aim for the early Byzantine period, but working on the issue, I soon realized that this was not an immediate viable option, and I decided to focus on early Byzantine carvers to estimate their income and living standards. I hope this will not disappoint you. But, well, the economic world of early Byzantine carvers cannot be easily recovered. Yet, information of construction workers, contracts, livelihood, and relationships with patrons and local communities can be found in a variety of sources. I will start framing <clears throat> the picture and uh, <clears throat> we should say that material constituted a substantial part of an artist artisan's cost. But in many cases, as far as architecture is involved, this cost was, <clears throat> in, the, in the vast majority of cases, covered by the patrons themselves. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> if we <clears throat> consider marble, the cost of marble, Diocletian's price edict provides us with important information about the cost of marble in the early 4th century AD. Unfortunately, the edict is far from being straightforward. The section dealing with marbles, chapter 31, measures them per, fo per foot, pes, pos, but it is not clear whether it is a cubic or square foot. However, as Simon Corcoran and Janet Delane have argued, the cubic foot measurement makes these luxury materials appear very cheap. And it is reasonable to assume that the edict values them in square feet, not in cubic feet. 
<clears throat> in the same way, it is reasonable to assume that the DA edict values them, sorry, um, in the same way, the edict um, lists several qualities of marbles and Proconnesian and Tajan marbles commanded the lowest price <clears throat> among all the stones cited in it, respectively. I think you can see these figures, 40 and 50 denarii per, per foot. These rates, of course, reflect the economic situation peculiar to both the chronological periods and the geographical region in, in which the edict was promulgated, that is to say Antioch in the late <clears throat> year 301. And so need to be treated with caution, but these figures are nonetheless indicative. Several reasons explain the relative cheapness of Thesian and Proconnesian marble. Firstly, it has been long recognized that overland transports costs were much higher than sea and river transport in antiquity. Both Proconnesos, Pro Proconnesos and uh, Tazos were islands, and their marble could be loaded on waiting ships straight from the quarries. In the same way, both the islands were close to important markets and a major consumption center, Tazos to Thessaloniki and Proconnesos to Constantinople, where its marble was destined for the building projects sponsored in the <clears throat> imperial capital by the Constantinian and the Theodosian dynasties. I will focus on Proconnesos, Pro Pro Proconnesos <clears throat> and uh, um, we should say that uh, the local quarries were exploited starting at the end of the 6th century BC, but the quarries were made dependent on the imperial patrimony only in the 2nd century AD, possibly under Hadrian. Proconnesian marble was exploited into the 6th century AD, but there is no archaeological data for any significant production of it in the Middle Ages, even though there is plenty of evidence for its exploitation under the Ottomans. In late antiquity, the use of Proconnesian marble became a hallmark of imperially sponsored projects and was widely exported in the Eastern and Central Mediterranean. However, <clears throat> we should say that it was not only Proconnesian marble to travel, but also the carvers traveled, also the carvers who worked at it traveled. <clears throat> okay. The mobility of masons and carvers was motivated first and foremost by work opportunities. Indeed, building projects created groups of mobile workers. Instability of employment was one of the basic conditions of life for the construction workers in the pre industrial period. The seasonal nature of aggregate demand for labor dampened for the workers' prospect of finding full-time employment the year round, and job opportunities depended entirely on the needs of individual projects. Moreover, aggregate demand for stone increased enormously between the first century BC and the second century AD, in connection with the advent of the Roman rule and Roman style urbanization. But, by the second half of the first century AD, the golden age of public munificence at the local level has passed, and the number of public and privately financed buildings dropped sharply, with an obvious negative effect on the aggregate demand for stone. Consequently, this resulted in a lack of demand for the services of stone workers, and building activity was imperially and ecclesiastically dominated, and only Constantinople and a few other cities around the Eastern Mediterranean, Antioch and Alexandria, might have offered large enough markets for carvers. Several years ago, Cecil Stryker, John Malcolm Russell, and Janet C. Russell have plotted building activity in Constantinople over the 11th centuries span from its foundation to the Turkish conquest. Their analysis revealed four, four distinct clusters of new foundations, and these different um, clusters correspond approximately to the periods of Byzantine prosperity. The period which interests us here is comprised between roughly the second half of the fourth century and the late 
6th century AD. Well, when, when according to Cecil Stryker, John Russell and Janet Russell, we can extrapolate an average of two new foundations per year. Hence, we can assume that Constantinople was able to sustain a large professional population of carvers. This was not the case in the great part of the Mediterranean. And archaeological and epigraphic evidence shows that professional carvers from Constantinople can also find job opportunities abroad, most often on imperially sponsored building projects. For the early Byzantine period, the epigraphic evidence shows that carvers did move far from their places of origin. <clears throat> the terms most widely used for men who worked in stone were litoxos and marmorarios, and his precise form, marmorarios. Marmorarios was an overarching title which covered numerous specialisms from marble traders to carvers. In our case, marmorarios often indicate carvers and sculptors. Several craftsmen from <clears throat> nowadays Marmara are also known from several sites around the Aegean Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. Epitaphs of Proconesian carvers are known from Kizikos, while a 5th, 6th century <clears throat> epitaph from Gortina in Crete remembers a certain Theoctiste from Byzantium, that is to say Constantinople, the wife of a Litoxos. <clears throat> Sorry. In many cases, we can be pretty sure that um, carvers traveled along cargoes of stone. In many cases, stone objects received a considerable amount of shaping at the quarries before being shipped in order to reduce their weight. But even in those cases when architectural elements were imported, nearly or, few, or <clears throat> fully finished, carvers would still have been needed to fix them in place. Good archaeological evidence for itinerant carvers is provided by the Porto Nuovo shipwreck, sunken off Corsica in the first century AD, where a bundle of tools belonging to a sculpture was recovered with a cargo of Luna marble blocks. For the early Byzantine period, an obvious example is the Marzamemi shipwreck, sunken off the coast of Sicily in the first half of the 6th century AD, while carrying a primary cargo of nearly 100 tons of extensively prefabricated architectural materials, at least some destined to a church. 28 columns shaft, 32 bases, and 35 Corinthian capitals, several panels and pyre columns pertaining to a chancel screen and a Verdi Antico ambo. Similar shipwrecks have been recovered at Hamrit, for example, near present-day Tartus in Syria, and, this, and this, its cargo included 20 Corinthian capitals, 16 bases, one column shaft, one pilaster, and another shipwreck of this kind, sunken off Marmara in the 5th, 6th century, carrying 15 Corinthian capitals and 25 bases. From an archaeological point of view, we have archaeological evidence of sculptors from Constantinople traveling to other locations for specific commissions. A good case are basket capitals produced in, <clears throat> prefabricated, in a prefabricated shape on the island of Proconnesus, and where several finished Corinthian capitals of the soft acanthus type and ionic capitals have been found. While to date, we don't know any example of prefabricated basket capital from the island quarries. The large numbers of crafted out capitals in the systems of Constantinople represent the form in which basket capitals were shipped from the island to the imperial capital. That these items were, sh were shaped and finished on site 
is proved by the large quantities of marble waste reused as picking for the floor of the nave of the church of Saint Polyectus. You can see here waste cores and uh, <clears throat> on the right of the screen, you know, you can see this capital nowadays kept in Barcelona and a fragment of an unfinished capital of the same time, of the same kind found on the site of the San Polyectus church. If we move to Greece, <clears throat> we have a good example of itinerant carvers <clears throat> at the so at the so-called Legion Basilica in Corinth, where the presence of several carving styles should be thought as the work of two different groups of artisans. The presence of rough the hout architectural elements in Proconesian marbles marble seems to indicate the presence of Constantinopolitan carvers working alongside local craftsmen sculpting in limestone. In the same way, we should mention the basket capitals and imposed capitals from the Basilica Vita at Filippi. These items were sculpted in local marble by carvers who had already carried out the decoration of Hagia Sophia at Constantinople. All this archaeological evidence can be paired with written sources providing plenty of information on itinerants, masons, and scarvers. The best examples is for sure given by, for the early Byzantine period, the mountain district of Isauria in southeastern Anatolia, which was fabled in antiquity for robbers and stone cutters. Before the sixth century, Isaurians worked on construction projects within the region of origin, but from the beginning of the 6th century onwards, um, these workmen are attested in Constantinople, where they worked on Hagia Sophia, and at the monasteries nearby Antioch and Jerusalem. So, uh, written evidence gives us information about uh, the way in this work was paid written evidence, mostly um, Egyptian papyri, suggests that construction workers earn daily wages. <laughs> this does not route the, rule out the possibility that on larger projects, craftsmen were likely to be paid on a single installment rather than a daily wage. However, the daily wage must have been the most common method of payment. Even in this case, our best source is the Diocletian's Price Edict and its chapter seven, in which the rate of marmoraris pay is given at 60 denari. This, their salary is higher than, the simple, than that of simple lapidari, possibly store, um, stone cutters, and was surpassed only by wall painters 75 denari and by portrait painters 150 denari per day. Less than a century later, the promulgation of the edict around 381, Gregory of Nyssa offers remarkable insights into the building of an, of an octagonal martyrion and um, into relations between management and skilled labor. This is not the place to discuss in depth the features of this martyrium, but we can say that <clears throat> several reconstructions have been proposed and that, you know, this building, which is today lost, it's, has been compared to the martyrium of St. Philip in Hierapolis. Writing to Amphilochius, his third cousins and the Bishop of Iconium, Konya in central Anatolia, Gregory provides a detailed description of the martyrium, a highly elaborated centrally planned church. He intended to build and ask, it, and ask Amphilochius himself to, see him, to send him as many craftsmen as he possibly can. I know, Gregory says, that workers in your region area are better for our need than those that can be hired here. These craftsmen were entrusted with the carving of molded bases, Corinthian capitals, 
and the 40 columns and marble doorways of the porch required sculpting as well. Gregory writes Amphilochius because he had offered a team of 30 workers for a gold piece per day plus, plus food, a rate that he considered <coughs> exorbitant. If you look at this passage, we can see a reference to food rations, which is a very interesting uh, feature. In the case of the jobs with daily wages, Price edit, the Diocletian's price edit consistently adds a food hollow one's pastus. The pattern seems to be that daily wages included a pastus and that known or almost known of the other payments did. What the pastus included is not specified and was probably left to social convention. Today, a cash wage plus food allowance is a common scheme in many third world countries and building accounts, for example, from medieval England and from Renaissance Italy record mixed payments in both cash and kind. We have epigraphic evidence for this kind of mixed wages <clears throat> in an inscription found in Syria in the locality of Herbert Tazan dated to 507. The inscription sets the expenses for extraction of a church at 580 nomismata or solidi and 430 bushels of beans, grain, and dried apricots. Another common <coughs> method of payment must have implied the payment of a task fee greater than a wage rate. Craftsmen were contracted to carve a, a given number or architectural elements. In this case, we can quote again Gregory's letter, which is of the greatest interest for the organization of the workforce. Gregor, Gregory writes Amphilochius to negotiate the contract with the craftsmen. And if the workman, if the worker wants to contract with us, let the definite measure of work as far as possible be fixed each day. Lest he pass the time idly and subsequently, though he has no work to show for it, demands payment for having worked for us for so many days. At the end of the sixth, early seventh century AD, the Egyptian stonemason Phileas, who had received an important commission for the repair of the church of St. Philoxenos in Oxyrhynchus, drew up a list of all the items he had provided. He listed the stones for the walls in batches of 50, totaling at least uh, 5,524 blocks for several different walls, as well as 120 capitals and 120 bases and mentions measurements for the decoration of the arches of the colonnade. A similar arrangement, in my opinion, is not dissimilar from the locatio conductor contracts, which regulated the exploitation of quarries. Contractors, in this case, received a fixed payment for working a cesura, a quarry inside within a district where marble was extracted, and in turn were obliged to extract a set amount of quarried products, presumably within a limited period of time. If we look at the imperial period, at the Roman imperial period, the baths of Trajan in Rome contain numerous painted inscriptions on the brick walls, signaling the day and date on which they were built. The same procedure was applied in the baths of Caracal, where the construction of the substructures and superstructures appears to have been carried out in sections by different teams of builders. After all, the most rational solution on a large and highly ornate building, such as Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, was to divide workers in teams and to assign them to different zones. This kind of organization finds support in the distribution of Mason's Marks in the Greek Church. Here, typologically related Mason's Marks group themselves in clusters and, clearly, and are clearly and clearly recognizable units. These units, as 
Andrea Paribene has recently demonstrated, may reflect some kind of arrangement or organizational units. And we, we can be sure that the business marks in this case were used just in the payment procedures of the workforce <clears throat> employed on the building yards of the, the Greek church. If we consider Constantinopolitan and Exarian um, carvers, we can consider them as full-time professionals. But we have archaeological evidence of the fact that um, part-time sculptures also existed. And I think the best example in this case is <clears throat> provided by late antique Syria. Late antiquity was a period of great building in the limestone massif of northern Syria. The limestone massif is the area in black. This development was the result of considerable expansion of oil production, often destined for overseas market. In the limestone massif, rural villages grew in size and increased in density. And the absence of public buildings, except from baths and churches, may reflect the organic and self-organized natures of these communities. Houses of different sizes indicate some distinction of wealth or status, but there are, these buildings are not differentiated by very marked contrast of building materials and decoration. The overall impression, at least in an early phase between the 4th and 5th centuries AD, is of a homogeneous society with families sharing the same socioeconomic position of free peasants and tenants. Ethnographic evidence suggests that these houses were built by families or clan groups or by a particular neighborhood. And this was the case for sure of churches too. This situation precludes a clear separation between skilled and unskilled workers, and many artisans and craftsmen may have worked as seasonal workers when they were free from agricultural works. Tools belonging <clears throat> to a sculpture were recovered in a peasant house at the Hes, for example, while a sculpture's workshop has been excavated in Pirsa, where the ground floor of the so-called Maison du Sculpteur shows a series of sculpted panels with geometric and vegetable motifs composing a sort of sample book. So what about the standard of living of an early Byzantine carver? We, we, may have, we, we may ask how prosperous were the early Byzantine carvers. This is not an easy question to answer, but we can bring together many kinds of evidence to address the question. As Jairus Banaji has demonstrated in late antiquity, gold currency circulated well beyond the confines of the upper classes. From the middle decades of the fourth century on boards, the stock of gold currency experienced a considerable expansion. For sure, as pointed out by John Holden, the wide circulation of gold coins, solidly or numismata, reflects the needs of the state and its fiscal, administrative, and military machine. In the fourth century, commutation of tax in kind into gold, the so-called aderatio, became the norm, and then taxes were paid entirely or partially to the soldiers and civil servants as money. This inje injected huge quantities of gold solidity into circulation. Hence, the, gold, the golden solidus was used for a wide range of transactions, wages, loans, rents, and taxes. For the salaried middle classes, late antiquity was an age of comparative affluence. The expansion of wage labor was a striking feature of the late antique Eastern Mediterranean, and the urban economies of the East were vibrant enough to allow for the existence of a wide range of professional categories. 
from money changers to bankers, jewel traders, silk merchants, black and silver smiths, weavers, glassmakers, carpenters, and so on. However, as said, instability of employment was one of the basic conditions of life for construction workers in <clears throat> comparison to these other professional categories. <clears throat> it is notoriously difficult to estimate the buying power of money in the ancient world, given that the sources cover wide geographical areas and different circumstances. However, in the last few years, several attempts have been made to establish a basket of prices which can be compared to wages. In this respect, works by Robert Hallen has provided a useful model. He distinguished between the bare bond basket that would ensure a mere survival from the respectability basket, which indicates the goods that every self-respecting person at a given time and place would expect to be able to consume. The latter includes 12 products, wheat, bread, beans, olive oil, cheese, eggs, wine, soap, linen, candle, lamp oil, fuel. And I will focus on food and clothes. For the fifth and the sixth centuries, the most useful discussion on prices and salaries is by Cecile Morrison, and her studies can be integrated with the recent work of the already mentioned Robert C. Helen on the Diocletian's price aid. Most of the papyri provide us with several data. For example, we had, we know, <clears throat> you know, the civilian wages in Egypt and in Constantinople between the sixth and seventh centuries AD. When John the Lydian was taken on as a cartularius in Constantinople, he received an annual salary of 24 solidi, while a senior manager working for the wealthy Egyptian family of the Apioni had an annual income of 30 solidi plus a substantial quantity of wheat and barley. Even workers on the lower levels of the social ladder did not fare badly at all. We have evidence of two Egyptian workers who earned 12 and 6 uh, and a half nomismata per year. In the early 7th century, water carrier to the buff in Egypt earned three solidi per year. And around 620 AD, a shopkeeper from Constantinople had an annual income of 15 solidi. In a contract dated to 588, a goldsmith's helper was paid three solidi per year. Around the middle of the 6th century, Daniels of Scythes tells the story of Eulogius, a quarryman from the Thebaid, whose daily wage was a one keratian, a 24th of a solidus. With his salary, <coughs> Daniel says, Eulogius <coughs> paid his rent which was looking for his home, which was located on, a, on an estate, and could indulge himself in words of charity. According to Cecile Morrison, this figure is too high, as it amounts to an annual income of 12 solid. However, given the seasonal nature of building works, brief periods of heavy work alternated with lengthy periods of inactivity. So I believe that this sum should be reduced of at least two or three solidi per year. Again, if we consider the figure of 30 of solidus per day given by Gregory to his workers, <clears throat> in this case, we have an income of 10 solidi per year, while in the, in the, four, in the later fourth, fifth centuries, fifth to seven solidi was the average. I think that these high wages may reflect the strong bargaining power which um, specialized craftsmen acquired in late antiquity. For example, a well-known Constantine manuscript releases marmorari, lapidali, and sculptores and other artifices from compulsory public services. And this legal text is indicative of the high demand for the artisanal skills in the construction trade. 
A similar case is offered by the famous building inscription from Sardis, dated to 451, as the text details an agreement made between an association of builders and city authorities. This is not the place to discuss in depth the inscription, but it reflects the favorable employment opportunities open to those in the building trade. The Builders Association appears, in fact, to have negotiated salaries with the municipal authorities of Sardis around the mid of the 5th century. If we come back to Robert C. Allen's respectability basket, which includes food, wheat, bread, and wine, and non food communities like cloth, rent, and fuel, <clears throat> we <clears throat> should consider the fact that food was by far the most expensive item in the basket of the working man, while rent and clothing costed much less. As far as food, the annual composition of grain, the, uh, the annual consumption of grain of members of an average poor peasant household, two free adults and three four children, may be estimated at between 30 and 35 modi for adults and between 15 and 20 for the children. Hence, total annual consumption can be estimated at between 105 and 185 modi. Between 494 and 541, in a time of good har harvest, a solidus would buy between 30 and 40 modi of wheat. In this way, with a monthly salary, one of the Gregory Scalvers could buy more wheat than the bare minimum needed for annual survival. Moreover, we should consider the fact that expenses for food could be cut by substituting wheat with cheaper cereals and by consuming a modest amount of meat. It's, if cereals are likely, are likely to have meat 60% of the ancient world's caloric need, wine and oil accounted for more than 20% of it. For wine, Allen assumes an average consumption of 68 liters per year, and the average price of Egyptian wine mentioned in papyri works out at 1 25th of solitus per 10 metric liters. Oil prices are always higher than those for wine and work out at half of a solitus per 10 metric liters. And in this case, Allen assumes an average consumption of five liters per year. As seen, food allowances were fairly common in the Roman Empire, as they were in the medieval and more early modern world, as they are today in poor countries. John Chrysostom's yet says that the self-employed artisans were better off than craftsmen in wage employment since employers often cut a substantial part of their wages on the pretext <clears throat> that, way that they fed their workers. However, at least in some cases, food allowances must have contributed to raise living standards of many categories of workers. For example, the Syrian part-time carvers of the limestone massif must have enjoyed a respectable life quality. They were probably self-sufficient in food production and consumption and increased their earnings working in the building industry. As far as clothes, it is not easy to assess their cost. Textiles varied enormously in terms of quality and accordingly of price, while the second-hand market supplied clothing to the poorer levels of early Byzantine societies. Papyri and written sources record the prices of several items of clothing, for example, a dalmatic or tunic and a maphorium, a sort of cloak with a hood, both costed one third of a soldus at the end of the fifth century. And a sixth century papyrus mentions an embroidered tunic which costed one third of a soldus. I'm getting close to uh, the end of this paper. <clears throat> And I'm perfectly aware of the fact that this data may give a distorted and greater impressionistic picture of the historical reality. However, it is reasonable to assume that the early Byzantine carvers 
earnings could generate an income well above the thresholds level. We should also take into consideration that in antiquity, much labor was family oriented and families worked together to maximize their economic well being. Ancient carving workshops are usually assumed to have been small enterprises with only a handful of workers. The evidence provided by inscriptions suggests that most workshops were essentially family units, even though they, and even though uh, they are unreliable sources, most representation of carving, just like this, also tend to depict no more than a few workers. As many of the jobs listed in, in the Diocletian price edict, the marmorari were part of the middle class and top layers of the labor market. Hence, and I conclude here, carvers belong to the ranks of these moderately prosperous individuals. Thank you for, for your attention. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to try to answer to them. Thank you very much, uh, Yuri, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Also very interesting. And I'm very impressed by the picture you painted of the life and status of this craftsman. Uh, also because of these aspects are often uh, only marginally uh, considered in architectural uh, research, but uh, I think that are crucial to understand their work, the real work, and also uh, the real life of this stone masons uh, and they are, um, and uh, also how their lives were organized. So we can start uh, with the debate uh, and um, if there are any questions uh, or um, does anyone uh, want to ask anything? Okay, maybe I can start. Uh, I have a question for you. Is there, um, so, uh, is there any evidence from uh, unseen sources uh, of the work of a child or woman uh, um, in these activities? Do you well, uh, I, think about it? I, I, I should admit that I don't know anything. Mm, I, there seems be no evidence for you know the involvement of uh, children and women in the building in <clears throat> industry uh, in the early Byzant in the Roman and the early Byzantine periods. For sure, there is evidence for female artists in the ancient Greek wars. This is not my field, so. But I, I know, for example, that uh, you know it seems that women worked in uh, vase painting workshops, and I think that Pliny mentions one uh, Hellenistic female painter. I know a few evidence from the um, medieval and early modern world. And we know, for example, that women worked, for example, in Florence uh, on the building site of the <clears throat> local cathedral as uh, plasterers. And in some cases, they, they assisted the men uh, you know, yes. transporting small amounts of uh, bricks and uh, rubble. But, uh, you know, if you look at kilns, we know for sure that children and women uh, work as uh, brick molders. But, you know, <clears throat> uh, possibly there's a gap in our sources, but I don't know any text mentioning or any signature, artist signature mentioning uh, a female uh, sculpture. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, maybe there is a question from uh, Dr. Platon Petridis. It's a pleasure to see Dr. Petridis yes, hello, here. Martin. I'm glad to hear you, Yuri, too. Uh, Thanks. And I must say that although I'm not, although I am not very fond of uh, uh, quantifications and numbers in archaeology. I really enjoyed your, your paper. As always, I'm afraid I cannot, uh, uh, my camera is not working properly, so I can't. Uh, Don't worry, yeah. Here's my, here's my camera, but I'm, I think you're hearing me. I have a question about the, yeah. um, the quarries of Aliki in Thassos. And yeah. the, uh, the, the 
the idea that these uh, workers have always been uh, considered uh, seasonal workers. Okay. Okay. Uh, in Aliki, we have um, excavated the quarries, okay, and two quite big basilicas, as you know. We have never excavated the houses. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm thinking that if we have these two big basilicas, uh, yeah. they must have been used by some people who were not uh, seasonal, but who were, they were always a resident there. population, and yes. Yes, a, a stable population who was working in the quarries. So um, were there any quarries like Proconisus and Thassus, for instance, where workers were working all the time? Um, I don't know if winter, in winter time, it was, they, were, they were able to do this work, of course. Uh, so, if you can clarify this subject for me. Well, you know, no, thank you very much for this uh, question, which is very interesting. I perfectly agree with you with the fact that possibly the existence of big basilicas on the island is, you know, um, a hint for the existence of um, a stable and resident population all the year uh, around. I know, well, Again, we don't have any evidence from ancient sources, but uh, you know, if you look at the medieval and early modern documentation from the Car Carrara marble quarries in central Italy, we know for sure that uh, quarrying stopped during winter, but during, you know, the <clears throat> during winter, uh, carvers uh, spent their time uh, producing uh, small items just like, you know, mortars. And that's very interesting because mortars are um, a kind, a, ty a typology of, uh, you know, artifacts, which, for example, uh, has been found um, in shipwrecks, in early Byzantine shipwrecks and so on. And in many cases, they are made in um, Proconesian marble. So I suspect that possibly during winter, uh, the quarrymen, produced this sort of uh, small items, and I think that they were free to uh, sell them on the free market. They were not subjected in this case to any uh, locatio conductio um, contract. So it's just an hypothesis. I think a different, we, we can uh, consider a different situation, for example, in Syria. In, the, in this case, I think that, you know, uh, there was a seasonality of uh, work and there is a beautiful uh, ethno-archaeological work by uh, Besak and his, you know, Syrian uh, collaborators who explore the exploitation of uh, contemporary uh, <coughs> limestone quarries by local uh, peasants. So it's a sort of seasonal activity in this case too. But I, I, I agree with you that, you know, Tazos and Marmara should have had a resident uh, uh, population for sure. Okay, thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you and uh, are there any questions? I have another question for you. Okay. <laughs> are, You're there, more than welcome. Yeah. <laughs> are there um, um, gravestones with the image of the of the stone mason? Do you know if there are? You, you know, depictions of carvers. Mm -mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, there is this one. It's late On Roman. Graves. Yeah, and you know. Uh, there are several uh, depictions of carvers in late antique art. For example, you know, uh, the image that I have chosen for the poster is, um, you know, taken from the Virgilius Romanus, which, which is a late 5th, early 6th century, and it depicts the building of Carthage. Then um, uh, I know for sure that uh, there are other, you know, depictions in um, Northern African uh, mosaics, quite similar to this one. And um, uh, if you look at the Umayyad palaces in Syria, well, possibly I'm wrong, in Syria or in Jordan, you can find the same kind of uh, uh, depiction of, um, carver, uh, of carvers and stonemasons in one of these 
to my uh, buff. The funny thing is that if, if you compare these uh, images to, you know, late medieval and uh, uh, Renaissance uh, paintings, you see the same kind of um, image, but it's simple because, you know, stonework is one of the most conservative job and traits, so it didn't change much till the late uh, 19th century and the 20th century with the industrialization of uh, boring activities. Thank you very much. And uh, well, uh, that's very interesting because I think, you know, all these signatures by Marmorari, these sort of depictions, the fact that these people used to indicate its provenance in epitaphs and so on, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, evidence for a strong sense of identity, a strong, a strong sense of professional identity. And I think that these people were proud of its job. Thank you, Yuri, very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Now, I think we have a question from Dr. Olga Karagorgia. Yes, another friend I'm happy to see. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello, Yuri, thank you very much. It's great to see you and uh, thank you very much thank for you. your paper. Um, the, I mean, I also followed with interest your reply to uh, the question that uh, Platon asked, which is, you know, a very important question. Um, my question has to do with something else. Um, I was wondering whether we know anything about the uh, the tools that uh, the people used in the quarries. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, certainly, the, we would all agree, I think, that uh, uh, as centuries go by, uh, Byzantine architecture, shall we say, loses in monumentality. I mean, the, the columns that they have used in St. Sophia uh, are, uh, extremely tall, large. I mean, there is also this uh, um, um, fable recorded in the Diegesis of for St. Sophia that these columns, the Diegesis of the ninth century, that these columns were actually stolen from the Artemision of Ephesus, only because the people of that time, the ninth century uh, Byzantines, could not grasp how is it possible that such large columns were transported, you know, and then put up in the church. Uh, so the question has to do with whether we know uh, anything more or if there is any work has been done on how work was conducted on the quarries, how these stones were cut. Actually. Yes, we... Sorry. No, that's, that, that's okay. the no, main... We have yeah. a lot of evidence for, you know, uh, the quarrying of uh, shafts. And uh, I don't know, well, it's a good question. I don't have any idea about the fact that they seem to have lost, you know, the capacity to quarry monumental uh, shafts. But for sure, you know, shafts were very expensive. Possibly they were mo the most expensive item uh, in antiquity. And, uh, you know, in the <clears throat> early Middle Ages, in the West as in the East, they were often reused and I don't know any evidence about uh, shaft quarrying in that period. I think that there are a few uh, very crude stone shafts from Anglo-Saxon England but that's not my period and um, neither my period neither my area. What, what can I say is that a geographical text often uh, mention the um, reuse of uh, column shafts. And for example, if you go to Pisa, to the cathedral, there is a beautiful inscription mentioning the fact that they erected <clears throat> columns and that they celebrated this kind of uh, work as a huge enterprise. I don't know, well, I've never explored the topic, so I, I cannot be okay. of great help, but, but it's, mm -hmm. well, it, that's very interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. Don't know, but sorry, I don't have, um, no problem. We're okay, just wondering. An answer, Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now we have a question from our director, Papi. Yes. Thank you, Yuri, for your presentation. 
Uh, I would like to ask you uh, this. How do you know that the tools found in the Porto Nuovo shipwreck are in relation to the staff of the marble workers and not to the cargo itself and to the export material? And I have another question. If we have any data on the um, workers or the manpower on the reuse of the ancient marble. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for the question. And uh, well, I know, well, mm, they found a band, two bundles of, on the um, Porto Nuovo cargo, they found two different ki uh, typologies of uh, tools. One possibly was used for the working of soft stone. The one that I, that <clears throat> I show, uh, were used for strong and very hard uh, rock, just like marble. And we know that they were, you know, uh, a personal item because they were signed. They bear uh, mm, <clears throat> a signature on it, a mark of it. So we, 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 we can think that they were, you know, uh, they were traveling with, with their owner. And it's a very strange situation, possibly because uh, the cargo was directed to Southern Gold, and they also found a sword on uh, <clears throat> among the materials from the shipwreck. So, this possibly the, the boat was carrying a sort of official cargo for um, <clears throat> an official building project. And I, I, I think that uh, you know there were. There, there was at least one car were traveling with the, um, with the, with the marble. And uh, Patrizia Pensabene, for example, thinks that many uh, marble, <clears throat> a lot of marble architectural decoration in Southern uh, Gaul were carved by um, people coming from Italy and from Rome. So I, I know it's just an hypothesis, but it's, I think it's a convincing one. Secondly, as far as you know, the manpower about uh, the manpower used in the um, work in the reuse of stone, I think that it was a specialized one because it, you know, the dismantling of a building is um, as much as complicated and a complex work just as you know the building of it. So for sure, you have to employ. Um, specialized uh, workforce on the dismantling uh, yards. I don't know if uh, we have any direct evidence for antiquity because it's, uh, you know, the existence of a specialized workforce in, for the dismantling of building. It's a hotly debated uh, topic, but for sure we know that in Rome, uh, in the, during uh, <clears throat> the 15th, 16th, and 17th uh, centuries, they use, there were, you know, specialized workers working on the dismantling of um, buildings. So it, it was a branch of the building industry, I think. Well, if there are any further questions, please feel free to join the debate. Okay, if there are no more questions, maybe before to concluding this um, meeting, I would like to remind you that the next meeting will be on uh, May 25th, 25th uh, and will be organized by my colleague uh, Barbara Carre, and uh, the speaker uh, is uh, Philip Bess. Thank you again to Yuri Marano thank for you his all. wonderful presentation and uh, thank you Thanks, all. Bye. Thank you all for attend attending at this meeting. Thank you very much. Ciao. Grazie mille. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Arrivederci. Noi ci